Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Corianne Stephenson with PwC's America, and I'm happy to be joined by Marco Avalanides, who is with Finance, a managing partner, or the managing partner at Finance Concepts, as well as an esteemed press professor at NYU. Thank you, Corey. Great. Well, we've been uh, talking a lot about um, center, uh, central counterparties, and uh, the discussion has moved towards uh, systemic risk. And I'm wondering what your view is, Mark, on whether or not uh, the Title VIII and the uh, move towards uh, so the designation of systemically important financial market utilities has done anything to either increase or decrease systemic risk. Okay, I, that's a great question. We could be talking for. for a long time, and I think it's obviously a debate that, you know, it's hard to settle, but I would say that there, people have to, when they look about to central counterparties, they have to look at two things. What, the idea that you exchange the, the risk of a, a given counterparty in a bilateral agreement to a central risk counterparty, therefore, you know, that's one of the things you eliminate bilateral risk. And the other one is something that people don't talk so much about, which is portfolio compression. Because we could have, for example, three people that their positions add up to zero, but they're linked in such a way that if one goes belly up, then it, it has an right. implication on the whole chain. But once you put them in a central counterparty, the actual net exposures of the central counterparty to each of the three people is much less, is much reduced because there's a lot of right. subtraction. And I think that I'm not alone. For example, Daryl Duffy from Stanford says that, you know, he actually changed his mind completely about uh, central counterparties and thinks they're a good thing. And he points out that this idea of, of uh, portfolio compression, everything is one of the great advantages of central county parties. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic because I think that in America, if we want to make things work, we make them right. work. Uh, even not only in America, but in other places. And we need to, we need to, to continue in that, in that vein, perhaps looking at the legal aspects, you know, the different covenants and the right. different, particularly when it comes to default management, to make sure that everybody is, uh, you know, that everybody's on the same page about right. what to expect from a CCP right. and so forth. And so as I hear you, it's it's a little bit of a mixed bag still in the fact that, well, there might be a great concentration between a few number of CCPs. The benefit may, in fact, at the end of the day, outweigh that concentration because of the compression. And that's really what brings the chaos into any type of uh, situation of a failure. And I think that brings up, and you just mentioned default management, and I think that that's a really an important um, aspect for us to be discussing and, yes. and maybe you could talk a little bit about you know how we're looking at default management from a listed perspective and maybe um, an yeah. over-the-counter perspective. Right. I, I think that uh, when the, it's very interesting that people see that when uh, the Dodd-Frank uh, law, etc., when it came into, it actually uh, was trying to put into central clearing a lot of things, you know, that, the, first of all, there's a link between, for instance, futures and swaps. Mm -hmm. So definitely you have to be considering, you know, fixed income products in general and you mix listed and over the counter. But there's a big difference because in over the counter uh, clearing, we need to find out what the price of financial price products discovery, is, exactly. price discovery, and particularly price discovery under stress situations. Therefore, the people who are going to to say, to, to actually contribute to these, they're going to bid on the portfolio, are the ones that also say, in a way, quote unquote, what the price of that portfolio right. is. And that generates a little bit of a, of a problem there. Yeah. That, that people, or massive a consternation. Massive, yeah. <laughs> so, so what happens is that what ha the practice is that in different asset classes, and according to the, the way the market has organized, it has done, for example, in certain areas, it's gone pretty smoothly. Right. And in others, there's a bit more dealers and, 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 and market participants feel that these products are much more customized than it seems. Right. And therefore, they're, they're reluctant to integrate them into the, uh, for, for many reasons. To, to. So I think that this, the way we're going at it is the way that we should go at it, is pro a product at a time right. and understanding the risk of each product and the market structure of each product at a time, rather than making it all one big bag, right. you know, one decree. And, 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 and also, I, would, I want to add another thing, which is 
You know this, you have the end users, the famous end users. Right. I just had lunch with one right now <laughs> <laughs> at an insurance company in Georgia. And they are actually a little bit confused because they were sold the fact that they would be safer, and they, but they're not all self-clearing, so they still have to face you know the the you know the street right and the street also can tell them all sorts of things that it's not that easy anymore and so on so we have to look at the issue of cost always yeah. this is an issue of risk and cost and i think that's what makes this uh, an interesting area of risk management i'm glad to be here in icbi yeah. talking about it because it's not just being ultra prudent but you can't kill the the the, the hen with right. the, you know the goose hen with, with the eggs. chicken or the, exactly. the hen with the eggs <laughs> exactly. well thank you marco that's yeah. been really informative thanks okay.